It's pretty close. It's what in what's time? NIST. You National Institute of Standards. What? <laughs> All right, gang. 7.30 p.m. I'd like to call this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society to order. Thank you for joining us on this kind of chilly Thursday night. A um, couple housekeeping rules. If you are not speaking, please mute your microphone. And uh, other housekeeping rules. If you have friends that cannot, uh, you don't see that are normally here, um, forward them the link in case they miss the email. Uh, some people claimed it had like a 20 minute delay between when it was sent and when they received it. All right, so um, I would like to start things off tonight with theme news, which we had a presenter that uh, wasn't able to do it because of other um, obligations this week. So I took advantage of the fact that I have a slightly less punishing schedule at my job, and there was a story near and dear to my heart, so I'm going to do it. One moment. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Jonathan gives it the thumbs up. All right. In the news, October 15th, 2020. So first story. Get your calendars out. Tune into NASA TV or its online stream this Tuesday, the 20th, in order to witness the OSIRIS-REx mission making its sample from asteroid Bennu. The stream will begin at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time as the craft descends for the touch-and-go maneuver that marks the climax of this mission. And uh, hopefully the touch of touch and go will be 6.12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Other OSIRIS-REx themed programming will be taking place on NASA TV Monday through Wednesday. So if you have been waiting a long, long time for OSIRIS-REx to grab that dirt, you will enjoy Monday through Wednesday of this upcoming week on NASA TV. All right, spaghettification. The ESO, in conjunction with um, other telescopes around the world, have spotted a rare blast of light from a star that's being ripped apart by a supermassive black hole. The technical term for this phenomenon is tidal disruption. You can see in this rendering the star being elongated like a tadpole as it is sucked into the black hole, hence the more fun name, spaghettification, and or the noodle effect. So this flare is the closest to be observed to date, 215 million light years from Earth, and has been studied in unprecedented detail. Meanwhile, Russian Soyuz MS-17, with one NASA astronaut and two cosmonauts aboard, made its trip to the ISS in record time, a speedy three hours and three minutes, from liftoff from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, as shown here, to docking. This was the first crewed test of a new fast-track rendezvous method that takes only two orbits to chase down the ISS. From 2013 to now, it's taken four orbits, or about six hours, to catch up to the ISS. Prior to 2013, it took a whopping two days for a Soyuz or Progress to catch up with the space station. As for the crew, we've got astronaut Kate Rubens, shown here with her two comrades, Sergei Rizikov and Sergei Kudsverskov. Um... It was her birthday on takeoff, so she turned 42. The Russian flight controllers wished her a very happy birthday. She and her comrades, the Sergeys, will be aboard the ISS for about six months as part of Expedition 64. And along for the ride is Yuri. Yuri is a dear little cosmonaut knitted by Kuzverskov's wife. He is the crew's zero gravity indicator. Once he begins to float, they will know they've made it to space. 
apparently each Soyuz crew gets to pick their own flight indicator. Meanwhile, in astronaut news, astronaut Chris Ferguson shocked the spaceflight community when he announced he was removing himself from command of the first crewed flight of Boeing's Starliner capsule. Ferguson, some of you may remember, already made history as the final commander of any shuttle flight when he and Doug Hurley flew Atlantis for her final mission in July of 2011. Hurley proceeded to become the senior crew member on the first ever crewed flight of a Dragon capsule earlier this year. So Ferguson would have likewise joined Hurley in the very small and elite pool of living astronauts who have flown multiple spacecraft. But he made an announcement on his Twitter feed that he was not going to do it. Happily, the reason is simple. His daughter is getting married next year, and he wants to make sure he's there for her. And of course, with untested spaceflight that has never been flown by human hands before, there's always that chance you don't come back. So, as disappointed as I am from a historical perspective, I gotta say I wish the man the best. He's a class act, and I'm thrilled to have gotten to see him in person. Jonathan Cage should like this since Venus is involved, except that Venus is being treated as chopped liver again. It is being used as a slingshot for the joint European-Japanese mission Bepi Colombo. It's completed a swing around Venus as of last night on its years-long journey to Mercury. Launched back on 20th October of 2018, it is going to ultimately need nine gravity assist flybys, one at Earth, two at Venus, and six slingshotting around Mercury before settling into an orbit around planet Mercury in 2025. Point of fact, uh, they actually do have a very ambitious observing program for both of the flybys of Venus. So it's not quite chopped liver. It is an ambitious um, a ambitious program. You're right. However, it is not going to be able to get really good data on the thing that has us most interested in Venus right now which is the traces as phosphine in the Venerian atmosphere, because it's a suite of instruments is calibrated for Mercury. It wasn't really designed to analyze Venus at that level. So even though we have a spacecraft right there to look for phosphine, don't expect super great results. Did, however, snap this nice picture. They had to turn off some of the um, instruments, specifically the star trackers, because the the light off of Venus is pretty intense, and it would have damaged them as bad, almost as bad as turning it directly at the sun. And Pluto continues to surprise. So take a look at these fascinating side-by-side -side pictures of New Horizons data of um, an alpine scene in Pluto versus some actual mountains on Earth. We've covered in the past how Saturn's moon Titan has a methane cycle that mirrors the water cycle on Earth. It, it's liquid, it evaporates, it turns into clouds, it condenses, it rains. Repeat. Well, on Pluto, methane ice atop its Cthulhu mountains are formed by a process that reverses how mountains are capped by water ice here on Earth. New Horizons data indicates Pluto actually gets warmer as altitude increases because the methane gas concentrated up there um, absorbs more solar radiation. So, but the atmosphere is too thin to impact the surface temperatures. And unlike Earth, where you have upslope winds, as seen in this image, Pluto has downslope winds. So you get ice on the mountains through a backwards cycle. Pluto continues to surprise. As for in the sky, you all know what the main story is. It's Mars. Mars reached opposition two days ago. Mars is phenomenal. This is a picture um, showing you how it would have looked on the night of the 13th with Sirtis Major front and center. Um, 
check it out. We've got favorable moon conditions. We've got a new moon tonight, near moonless sky for the next week. And I expect lots and lots of fabulous Mars pictures to go with the Comet Neowise pictures for the WASP calendar this year that we'll be talking about in the officer reports. However, there's something else that's a treat for you. The Orionids may be a good show this year. The shower will peak on the 20th and the 21st, but it's a lengthy shower. The advance guard should already be visible. Orionids blaze past at up to 66 kilometers a second, and at peak, it might be 20 an hour, which, okay, it's not exactly a meteor storm, but the smoke trails and the fragmentation can be spectacular. So, you know, would you rather see 50 lousy Perseids or one really good Orion? It might take a really good Orion. The new ish moon will mean good observing conditions over the next few days. Uh, again, the best opportunity to see these leftovers from Holly's Comet will be before dawn on the 21st. The radiant will be near the star Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion, which that part of Orion will be up before dawn on the 21st. I think Betelgeuse rises around midnight. Anyway, um, but you're not looking at Orion anyway. You're looking anywhere else in the sky. So hopefully some of us will get to see some Orionids while we're out there looking for Mars in a nice dark sky. If the weather cooperates. And that, friends, is in the news in the sky. We have uh, Adrian Bradley is on deck to present to us at the next quote unquote Cranbrook meeting. And um, if we could have somebody sign up for Macomb, that would be awesome. Any questions? You can unmute yourself for questions or throw it in the chat. All right, then we can proceed with the officer reports. As your president, I have some important announcements as we get towards the end of the year. Number one, the calendar committee, uh, which only has three people because one of the persons who was on it last year chose not to rejoin, um, would like another member to go through this year's calendar submissions and they would like pictures. So Bill Beers, I believe, put out a call to arms uh, earlier this week. So please send uh, your images to the current people on the committee, Bill and Jonathan Cade. We would love to have as many great pictures, drawings. Um, and remember that clouds, rainbows, and other cool stuff in the Earth atmosphere do count as astro images for the purposes of the WASP calendar. Because we could easily make it 12 images of Comet Neowise, but we like to showcase as many talents as possible. Also in committee news, uh, we currently have a two-person committee um, for the election, though we can have up to three. If you would like to help Dr. Dale Parton and Kenneth Burton help run the nomination and elections for our next meeting, do let them know. And uh, again, we can have one to three people. So we've done it with as few as one, but we can have as many as three. If you want to participate in WAS democracy, step right up to the plate. If you are interested in running for office, any office, really, you can knock off incumbents and we'll probably thank you. Um, any office, you can. Yeah, Bob's laughing. I see you laughing there, Bob. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, let the election company know. And they will be able to put together a slate uh, so that we can have a nice orderly election with uh, all the candidates known and uh, hopefully, you know, um, a nice, smooth process. We're, di we're, we're, a, a Diane, we're in dire need of uh, people to run for treasurer and secretary at this point. And that is the, those are the two areas we absolutely have to have. Anybody's interested at all. In that, please let us know. Um, we are uh, we're pulling uh, collars all the time to try and get people to do it, but we need to have people to get involved in that. We would appreciate anybody who would be interested in carrying that job, and I think that it's very crucial to us to have both of those. 
So. Yes. Well, we one cannot function without a treasurer, which is, of course, an intimidating job. But we do have a lot of capable ex-treasurers on hand to be able to advise anyone coming into the position. And uh, Glenn uh, has set a new standard for excellent minutes as our secretary. We're deeply sorry to see him go. But um, that can also be a really good way to get onto the board and get accustomed to being a board member. Because once you're on, they often don't let you leave which is why I'm president for the third term, kind of like Grover Cleveland. All right. So uh, that will be at the next quote unquote Cranbrook meeting. It'll be take the place of our short presentation. So make up your minds. There's only a couple of weeks to decide. We also have the very important and happy task of selecting service award nominees for our annual banquet. We always select a number of WAS members who have rendered distinguished service to the club, whether in the course of a singular year um, or over a long-term period of becoming part of the club's infrastructure or going so far as to effectively be married to the club. So we have awards ranging from the Blaine McCullough Award, which is, I see your hand there, Jonathan. The Blaine McCullough Award, which uh, is often for a newer member who's like throwing themselves in with the enthusiasm and has a focus on outreach and welcoming people and getting people, sustaining the membership. We have the Bob Watt Award for hands on, which is not given out every year. Some years, um, people don't really do the cool construction projects. Other years, people do something like uh, Mark Kedzier's program with libraries where we modified telescopes and loaned them out. We have the Larry Kalinowski Award for long-term members who have made themselves indispensable to club infrastructure. We have the Searles Award, the highest award we bestow for people who have made this club their lives. So if you can think of some people who might fit the bill, let us know. And finally, the banquet itself will be a virtual banquet this year. We, um, we have an excellent speaker lined up, thanks to Bob Trumbly. And we will hopefully be having really cool door prizes that we will find a way to distribute effectively, thanks to the beg letters sent out by Glenn. So we look forward to providing you as good a close to 2020 as we possibly can. And I think that's it for me, and I can pass it on to Dr. Dale, our program chair. You're on mute, sir. Sorry about that. Thank you, Diane. Um, <clears throat> so our next meeting is Monday, November the 2nd. It's our quote unquote uh, Cranbrook meeting where we normally would have a short presentation. We will not because we're having elections then. <clears throat> so, we will be having a full-length presentation uh, since it's two days after Halloween. Um, Jenny Pons is going to give a presentation called Space Ghosts, where she's going to look at some astronomical objects that have an interesting appearance. Um, then, on Thursday, November 19th, Diane Hall uh, is going to have a presentation entitled Unsung Historical Observatories. Uh, we are in need of speakers for future uh, meetings, particularly uh, early next year. At this point, we need one in January and others in uh, April. Uh, so feel free, either for a full length or a short presentation, let me know, please, uh, if you have something that you could share with the, uh, this organization. That's it for me, Diane. Thank you, Dr. Dale. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I should have brought this up in the context of my report, but Dale, and Jonathan, and Bob selected our Paul Strong scholarship recipient at the previous board meeting. We will be giving it to Victoria. Let me get make sure her name is correct. Mm 
Victoria Van Valkenburg. Yes. Throughout plans to pursue a degree in environmental engineering at U of M. We have gone from having only three applicants in the early years of the scholarship to 40. So our, uh, we are really helping the community there at Macomb County Community College. And y'all should be very proud at being part of helping make a deserving student's life a little better every year. And with that, I'll hand things over to Riyadh for the observatory report. You're muted, Riyadh. Diane and Dale, you are now co-hosts and can unmute people. Is Riyadh muted? He's not muted, but we don't hear him. We cannot hear you, Riyadh. I'm sorry, Riyadh. Maybe we'll have to say your report submitted electronically. All right. Riyadh, Riyadh had an excellent update um, at the Cranbrook meeting, which has been documented and submitted. So Stargate remains closed at this time to the general public. Um, we will let y'all know as soon as we are able to resume activities there. Riyadh also took care of the wasps. Okay. Um, Mark is arrived. Mark, Treasury report. I am here. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Okay. So, as at the end of September, we have 93 customers. We've taken in $2,000 this year. We spent 510. We have 22,290 in the bank. Uh, we no longer have 39 in checks because I cashed those, but $655 in cash. Uh, in total of $23,000 as of the end of September. The uh, GLAC account is pretty much unchanged since the last report. All the details are in the WASP. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Turns out a virtual GLAC is a lot cheaper than the kind where we have to rent a giant tent. Yep. And Glenn, secretary report. Oops. You are unmuted, Glenn, but we still can't hear you. Seems to be contagious. Good thing I have a mask. Oh, no. You know, WebEx installed an update, and I wonder if uh, that's not part of the problem. Oh, and now, now Diane is muted. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Ken. Okay, so that's not everybody. No, it's no. not everybody. Glenn, it's... could you try one more time? You might, uh, if you uh, if you click the little down arrow to the right of the word mute, it should give you some different options for microphones and try try selecting a different option for the microphone, maybe. Alas, I think. Well, all right. Glenn's most excellent minutes are in the WASP. He has already submitted the minutes for Cranbrook, and uh, the beg letters have gone out. So Glenn's uh, Glenn's got his bases covered for this month. Let's pass things to Mr. Robert Tremblay, and hopefully the curse of the mute button is not affecting him. Testing, testing. Okay, um, we had a GLAC meeting on the 8th, and we just hashed over uh, what happened and stuff like that. Uh, the, li the licenses that we bought for Zoom pretty much have expired. We just bought temporary ones anyway. 
Uh, some of the some of the things that we're going to do, we're going to do differently if we're going to do it again. We're looking at dates for next year. We're still hashing that out. There's a, there's kind of contention between two different weekends. Um, now, I, if if anybody is doing any outreach stuff, be sure you uh, email me so I can include that in my report for uh, uh, the WASP next time. I haven't got I, I've gotten a couple of those. Um, when it comes to GLAC, the next thing uh, I'd like to see is, um, since Astronomy at the Beach is over, is uh, GLAC promoting the clubs because, you know, w w in my opinion, GLAC needs to do more than just Astronomy at the Beach. But anyway, um, so I I'd like to start a coordinated campaign of plugging the clubs because if if I had known that these astronomy clubs existed when I was eight years old, I'd have been a member of them, but I didn't. And I want to fix that. Um, uh, other than that, yeah, if you're doing outreach events, let me know. Um, that's pretty much it so far. All right. And Bob and the rest of the GLAC crew should be taking a well-deserved victory lap for taking a crisis and turning it into a magnificent astronomy at the beach. I know I went over this in detail last meeting, but I cannot say enough, you know, what a fabulous job they did on recruiting people and pulling it off and uh, assembling the plane as it flies, as many a business I've worked for this year has described the experience. And remember, uh, many of those uh, sessions were recorded, so if you missed any, I am actually going to go back and hit a couple. I want to I see that spectroscopy one. So you can go back and see them. All right. Fabulous job. If you have done any outreach type activities, including virtual lectures, send it to Bob so he can incorporate it in his report. And with that, I will hand things over to Jonathan Cade, Publications Director and semi-willing maestro of the WebEx. The WASP is up. Jonathan, why don't you walk everybody through the protocol of the join live link since we have a lot of uh people kind of freaking out every single meeting i mean everyone should get a reminder email about 50 minutes before the start of the meeting that is five zero i don't control webex so if they are slow to send it out i can't really do anything about it um but i i guess i will just send an, a reminder to everybody who's signed up for the meeting beforehand and see if that works better. It seemed like that helped tonight, so I'll just do that next time too. Yeah. But You're using the same numbers, aren't you, each time now? Yeah, so yes. Macomb, Macomb is always the same one and Cranbrook is always the same one. So you can bookmark those and, and then just join those or add it to your uh, add it to your calendar. And those links should be good. I mean, they're different links for the different meetings, but they are stable across uh and and the one thing each month with the password i noticed something interesting about it it's it starts m 109 and it's an i not a one uh as the next one as as part of that thing so if you're going to put in the password that they ask you to do that says ends with beautiful just be aware that though that the second thing that looks like a one is actually an i that's all just thought i'd let you know and it may not ask you for a password if you join using the app directly from the email. So, uh, yeah, so seriously, no need to freak out if you don't have it in your box a day in advance or five hours in advance. It sends it out about an hour before, and it may take a little longer because WebEx does its own thing. Anything else, Jonathan? No. Nope. All right. So, uh, Solar Committee. Solar Marty isn't here tonight. He and I were talking last night. There is some activity on the sun. Um, I do believe, Bob, did you have that link up? Yeah, Bob could throw it up there. Uh, ooh, now Bob is silent, even though his mic is on. That's because I had my microphone up and off. Sorry. Oh. All right, so a sunspot. Um, 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 um. There we go. Get that one. Plus nine, six. Right. Show the sure. show yep, the sure. magnetogram, yep. Bob. Show the magnetogram as well. Yep. So there it is, just black and white. 
and we're to the magnetogram. It's showing magnetic activity. You guys seeing that? Yep. Okay. Solar cycle, is it 25 now? And uh, yeah, we're, we, we are definitely into the new cycle. Spaceweather.com uh, was confirming that a couple of weeks ago. And this is pretty cool. This is the 48-hour uh, video showing uh, 304 nanometers. And there's a lot of prominence activity. And you can see where the sunspot region is rotating into the view over on the left there. There's just a lot of activity there. Look at that. Time to bust out the old solar scopes again. All right, uh, double star group, assuming Riyadh's mic is still busted. Um, double star group will meet when we can all go to Stargate again. In the meantime, you are free to observe double stars on your own and submit an observing report. Uh, history group says nothing going on that's not already documented in the WASP. And so that leaves the Astronomical League. No news. Hopefully that's good news. Hopefully. All right. So that, I believe, concludes the officer report since discussion group is, of course, still on hiatus. And it's time for observing reports. In the interest of order, throw a, a one in the chat room if you'd like to be called upon to share your observing report plaid mac okay as a uh, official armchair astronomer here in the club i have a copy of the uh, to mars of love book that arrived just uh, about a week ago and i'm um, about halfway through it and it's a great read so i Highly recommend anybody in the club to purchase a copy. There is a link to it in, in the October WASP. And you get going to that, you get an autographed copy. That's my wow. opinion. That's the book by Patricia Strat. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you loan me the book for 15, 14 days on Kindle? Amazon Kindle. That's not on Kindle. Oh. That's the real thing. Uh, uh, next book, order a Kindle, then, then you can loan it to me for 14 days for free. All right. Is that all from the armchair astronomer? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the recliner pretty quick here. <laughs> All right. Do we have any Mars reports? Throw one at Bob Tremblay. Not a Mars report, but I uh, saw Connie off to work uh, yesterday before sunrise, and there was an absolutely beautiful waning crescent moon with Earthshine galore right next to Venus. And that was just like, I just sat there st looking at it going, I got to go get my camera. So I got my smartphone and took an absolutely disappointing picture of it. Been there. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Dale Hollenbaugh. So I, uh, I've been trying to get some photos of Mars um, and fighting the seeing conditions. I don't know. Probably my scope is uh out of collimation and um dusty and so forth i haven't really been able to get as much detail as i thought uh but i've been trying to get pictures of the moons as many moons as i can catch in the solar system and i got photos of both uh phobos and demos and and they're quite small so I was really happy with that. awesome um and uh, right after Mars is up, uh, Uranus is up, and I'm still searching to see if I can uh, get uh, a glimpse of Miranda, but as of yet, I haven't been able to. So that's, uh, that's eluding me. But uh, I shared some photos recently on, um, on the Facebook page uh, of Mars. I did get a, a semi-decent one at uh, 
uh, it wasn't opposition. It was a week before. What was it called? Um, closest approach. But um, perigee. Ago, I just no. Yeah. Perigee. Perigee. I'm not. I'm not sure it really counts as perigee, but that's what it's on the calendar as. Uh, there's a picture that uh, the Hubble just published a couple of days ago of Mars. I think I've got it here that I might be able to get it up to you. You want to see it? Yeah. I need to be able to share it, though. I don't have my ability to share. Let me think, I think you can just do it. Can you not? It's not giving me the ability to share. I don't know why. Weird. I well, did, I swear I didn't change anything about the meeting. I just made you presenter. Nothing to do with you. It has to do with this new system that's screwing with me. All I right. think WebEx rolled in with some significant <laughs> changes. Trying to see if I can get can you it. See my screen? It's letting me do this. So is that Mars blocked out with Phobos and Deimos, Dale? Mars isn't blocked out. It's that right. It's Holy moly. The sun. So you got Over it without even sun. using a, a bar. Wow. I just played around with the... Uh, now, this this is run... This is stacked. Um, and I ran it through wavelets to sharpen things. So it, it's using math to, to, to bring out contrast. Um, but, uh, I took this of Mars the same night. This is an infrared. I just couldn't get any good seeing. It was so blurry and jumping around. Uh, my new camera is very sensitive in infrared. I thought I'd give it a try. So closest approach I got this. So that's my best. And actually see the South Polar region. So, um, the other thing I saw this week, not Mars, but uh, I got a nice picture of the Pac Man Nebula. Very, very nice. So, my processing skills are getting a little better, but I didn't view this one visually, it was very dim. And normally for the planets, I do some visual work, but uh, I got my wife up after midnight to come on out and take a look at Mars. So, all right. Cool. All right. Any other observing reports? David Levy, yes. He's muted. Unmute, uh, David. You're muted. Okay. He's, he's good. I Is got it. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. See, I may be, I may be uh, okay at reading poems at uh, meetings here and finding comments, but I am horrible at astrophotography. I don't know how to focus, and I don't know how to capture an image. But I did last night see the Certus Major on Mars. It's right up there in the evening. Easy to see and uh, just love it. Trying to find the Utopia Planitia to see if um, they're building the Enterprise again out there, but I haven't been able to see it yet. But the Hellas Basin is clear and is really very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a report sent in from our man on the West, Gary Roth. It is a multi-night obser observation of Mars. I will condense it. Uh, thir 3rd and 4th of October, Certus Major, very prominent. Um, quite a few of the features were extremely pronounced. He, he said it was the best view of Mars since 2003. He was using a 5-inch Newtonian, and you could see... Iapigia, Duca Lyonis Regio, Latitudinal Prongs, and other things that I've sure never seen. Certainly certainly not the one time I got to look at it with the Yerkes scope. 4 and 5 October, seeing was only 
despair, and then turn to hopeless. 7th and 8th of October, good viewing night. Mari Serpentis observed it against the planet's limb. The Hellas Basin, however, could not be identified. And then finally, on the 8th and 9th of October, very clear, steady night. Uh, really good observing, including the right tip of Marit Samarium, which he described as a nose protruding from the west limb. And he notes the sky and telescope map included in their October issue was inadequate to the task of identifying the features. So that is actually quite helpful for those of us who um, would be relying on such. All right. If we do, we have any additional observing reports, announcements from other clubs, from people wielding dual or triple nationalities, club-wise. Diane, I got a I got a quick uh, update observer sure. observing report. Um, about a week ago, I had to scope out in the front yard for uh, a little early uh, Jupiter Saturn, and you know, beautifully clear night. But this time of year, we really struggle with the seeing as we battle uh, between cold air moving down, trying to dominate from the north and in the remnants of warm, moist air, some are trying to hold on. So it's been it's been really rough seeing. Um, and if I can, if I have a second, I'll share my screen and just show, um, I'll show the current jet stream uh, location, but it's, uh, you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, so here we are right here in the midst of the Great Lakes. You see the red is all jet stream that's current and going forward a day. So Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. Well, we don't have Sunday night. So in the next couple of days, jet stream dominates. Um, you know, we need some kind of high pressure to come in here and pump this thing up for a couple of days so we can get some last a good Mars viewing for the season. If it's any consolation, it's going to be awful weather for the next few days anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, we get what we can. It's get. not really <laughs> consolation, is it? But no. eighty millimeter uh, refractor is about all you need right now. Yeah, Jonathan and I had plans to go up north and whip out the big gun, but eh. Anyway, if that is the last of our observing report submissions, Dr. Dale Parton has a very special announcement that did not fit neatly into any of the officer reports, but definitely falls under for the good of the club. So take it away, Dale. Thank you, Diane. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, can you see that? Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Just this afternoon, I received an email uh, about this company called Plane Wave Instruments, uh, which frankly I had never heard of before. Uh, they've been doing telescope design and manufacturing since 2006 out in California. I think a number of the people who started it had spun off from Celestron back then. And they recently relocated to Michigan, Adrian, Michigan. Uh, recently, I think means about a year and a half or two years ago. Uh, they've already delivered a one meter telescope that was uh, built in Adrian, Michigan. And they also make some high end amateur equipment. Um, they have a NASA contract to make optics for space laser communications. And they bought a 57 acre campus uh, just outside Adrian, which also has the Adrian Center for the Arts on it and the Sam Beauford Woodworking Institute. Um, I guess I should have made this a little bigger. Sorry about that. Um, I had to look at a map to see exactly where Adrian was. Uh, it's a little beyond Ann Arbor. Uh, you can see a map here of how to get from the Stargate Observatory out to Adrian. Um, so they are building an observatory 
on the campus in Adrian, which will have a one meter telescope. They're also gonna build one and put it uh, in the high desert in Chile. Um, they plan to have college and high school students, as well as amateur astronomers use both of those observatories. The one in Chile, obviously remotely, at least for most ordinary mortals. Um, they are having an open house on their campus this Tuesday, just a few days from now. They'll be giving tours uh, where you will see how they make things um, and be able to ask questions about them. Each tour is only going to be 30 minutes. Uh, you can also um, tour their art center and their woodworking center. And uh, there's some company that has barbecue type lunches uh, that you can buy while you're there if you wish. If you're interested in going on one of those tours, uh, here's the information you need to do that. You need to make a reservation. You do need to wear a mask and practice social distancing while you're doing it. So I was just very surprised to find out that here we are in Michigan with a company that makes real nice telescopes. Um, didn't know that. That's my story. Very cool announcement. And hopefully somebody in this and, club and is able to take advantage of that tour. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say the um, the the big telescope at Cranbrook uh, for imaging purposes is a plane wave as well. That's true. Yep, sure is. Okay, it is eight seventeen. If we have no further uh, commentary for the good of the club, I'll let y'all go on a break. We will reconvene at eight thirty for our feature presentation. So, as you were, ladies and gents. So, so last year at Astronomy at the Beach, um, I bumped into, I think his name was Rick, one of the VPs at Plainway, and he had a decent, uh, I think it was 17-inch CDK, one of their uh, corrective Dow Kirkham um, OPAs, and he had one of their, uh, I think they called it direct drive. Uh, mounts. It was incredible how fast and how quiet that thing flew. It, it didn't use worm drives. It was like a direct magnetic. Uh, you could even bump it and it would just sort of, you know, go right back in. Um, so he could slew from, you know, one area of the sky to another in like two seconds. It was incredible. So I talked with him for quite a bit. At that time, uh, they were just completing their first one new telescope. And um, they invited me down. It's, it was over a two-hour drive. He said, yeah, we have an open house, and we're going to let people, we're going to stick it. In, it's normally meant for astrophotography, but we're going we're gonna to get some eyepieces on there and let the public view it before we ship it down to Chile. So it was pretty interesting talking with him. He was just one of the people excited about astronomy there, but it's like he's the owner of the company or one of the, the, the co-founders, I guess. So um, pretty amazing piece of equipment. It was large enough that he actually had it mounted to a trailer. Uh, at least he brought it on a trailer, uh, which was interesting. So the mount, is, it was probably one of the biggest pieces of equipment there. Anyway, so just an anecdote. The plane weight's no joke. They make serious uh, scientific instruments. Yeah. That was about a $30,000, you know, combo, I think. Um, between the mount and the OTA. They also write the software that Celestron uses for their mounts. Um, yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, you know, Mark, how much did you say was in the uh, treasury? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about that, and uh, maybe we could collaborate with them somehow, you know? <laughs> Where the plane wave putting, dome. Where are we putting it? I mean, hi, Adrian. Okay. Adrian, hey. You know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe if we like sweep 
sweep the place for a couple of months will make enough uh to... okay maybe not yeah just uh really quick i'm coming to you live from uh behind me hazel park field where you'll see me playing ball in the background so i'll just be listening in i don't think you can see my face i'll be listening in from time to time and uh when I'm in the dugout enjoying the meeting. Carry on. All right. Hey you guys, can you hear me now? Diane? I can, Riyadh. What happened? What okay. changed? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. I had to go and select a bunch of different uh, microphones, and one of them looks like it's working. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Like Jonathan said, they pushed an update to this stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened either. Last time it worked. So when are we reconvening, Diane? Uh, eight thirty, like normal. Okay, thanks. Actually, I've been looking at um, Plane Wave. Um, recently, they have reduced their prices, um, so. We could almost afford a 14-inch uh, on their um, direct drive. I think it's in the neighborhood of $22,000 or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, it's tremendous what they have. Um, but, you know, that means we would, we would need to have enough money left to have another building. We need like a roll-off roof or something like that. Because otherwise, yeah, where, where is it going to go? As somebody, who you know, uh, well, the thing is also, you know, it really deserves to be in nice dark skies. You know, yeah. there's a uh, there's a an observatory site uh, up in Black River, Michigan, that uh, would just be perfect for putting the clubs, uh, you know, the northern annex of Stargate, as it were. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm thinking this falls under conflict of interest. <laughs> I'm going to have to put the ixnay on this line of conversation. Does that mean anybody could go up to Stargate North to, uh, for weekend visits? To <laughs> Actually, yes, it would. That is Actually, cool. that, that is the plan. Yeah. That is the plan. For real? Yes. Well, I mean, not every weekend, but... No, the, the goal of the dark... Not every space... weekend, but as often as possible. The goal of the Dark Sky site that Jonathan and I have obtained where we plan to host the um, John Coslin 24-inch that we acquired um, is for outreach and astronomy parties and such. So is this separate from your home up there? Yes. it's Well, it's a, oh, about a half a mile okay. away. Okay. I was referring to, like, you know, your backyard. <laughs> But, well, uh, once we oh, okay. once we build our roll off roof, we're the plan is tentatively to build a roll off roof observatory up there next year, and then to keep the uh, telescope, the twenty four inch over there, uh, except during the winter. So maybe even during the winter because uh, I don't really trust the mice. So last thing I want to find is uh, do is open up the mirror box and find five little mouse nests in there. Yeah, we're going to let you all know when Dark Skies Alcona is open for business because the skies up there are amazing. I got a new portable mountain. I haven't even tried it yet, so now I uh, I have a place to go. <laughs> well, that means we can't blame you for the bad weather. <laughs> gotta, gotta blame somebody. But I haven't tried it yet. So is 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 the thing is you have to actually unbox it and set it up before the bad weather starts. I think all you have to do is trade pretty money for goods, and we can blame whoever acquires it. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Sorry.
keep your boxes in here. You see that picture that's behind me on the shelf? Kind of. Can I bring it closer? Yes. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Hey. This comes from the uh, 1800s. The thing that was neat about this is uh, it was uh, created by uh, James Naismith, a Scot Scottish guy who drew pictures. They looked at, or he drew pictures of what he saw through his telescope. And then he made a plaster sculpture of what he looked at and in bright sunlight, pictures of it. So he could have a, a photograph of a lunar surface. He was always illustrating his book. That is really cool. Yep. He also thought volcanoes made all the craters, too. Well, that's yeah. understandable. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't until Apollo 16 that many lunar selenologists uh abandoned the idea of volcano yeah, absolutely yeah even uh, uh patrick moore was a whole lot even beyond that so but it's, a, it's 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 fascinating all the uh little uh rabbit trails i'm following uh with this lunar stuff <laughs> i also have a because of the the luna cognita book i also now uh, have a book on uh, uh, mapping the moon, where it talks about the history of all the people who have attempted to map the moon, and boy, is that a pile of spaghetti. Cool, cool. All right, two minutes left before our feature of the night. Everybody can start filtering back to their seats. Or dugouts, as the case may be. Jonathan, have we got people on YouTube? Yeah, there's... Um... There's only 10 people. It's like there's some other kind of television event going on now, but I can't quite figure out what it would be. Well, I don't know what could possibly be more important than a watch movie. I know. <laughs> I mean, we're up to 32 people, which is still good for a Macomb night. That's true. It might be one of the uh, town halls that are going on right now. My My ignorance was purely for entertainment yeah. value. Yeah, we like to pretend that the WAS election is the only election that matters. Sometimes the truck uh, I think both goes, goes sour the following day. I think both town halls are going on now. Both the candidates are talking. Are we going to host a debate for the officer positions? <laughs> uh, debates are rewarded with an immediate forfeit and the other op the opponent dropping out. Nobody wants to be on the WASP board that badly. <laughs> be happy if we had two candidates for one office so we could have a debate. Yeah. I, I believe it's only happened once so far since I've been a member. Maybe twice. Well, maybe if the treasurer had more power, you know, I could, we could have a lot of money and uh, I don't know. 
then people might be more interested. Awarding contracts to nephews and things like that. On the other hand, it's generally good to have a lack of incentive for people to come to play with the money. I don't know. I've been in some organizations where um, $20,000 wouldn't stay in the account very long. So, were those organizations, uh, did they have three letter acronyms? No comment. <laughs> or, or four? No comment. Hey, Jonathan, guess what? I think it's time to return to the normal order of business. Oh, great. I'm not All stopping. Right. Yeah, please stop with the tape. Uh, all right. <sighs> I'd like to call this meeting back to order. Ladies and ge gentlemen, mute your mute yourself or we'll mute you for you. And I will turn things over to Dr. Dale Parton, our program chair, to introduce our esteemed guest speaker who stepped in at the last minute under fairly sad circumstances to save tonight. Take it away, Dale. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Diane. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> well, our speaker for tonight was going to be Dr. Pat Patricia Strath, uh, who is going to be talking on the topic, Is There Life on Mars? Unfortunately, she had uh, some serious health issues uh and absolutely could not be with us tonight she hopes that in the near future she will be able to give us a talk on is there life on mars and i will be in touch with her to schedule it if she's able uh, i might add that as dale teamy mentioned he's reading her book which i think it's called to mars with love and really enjoying the book so for tonight, uh, John Dumar, who was scheduled to give a presentation in January, I, I very graciously uh, hurried up things and uh, got himself ready to present tonight. John has been teaching physics and mathematics at Lutheran North High School. Uh, since 1982, he has a master's in science education degree from Wayne State University. Uh, he also worked at the Thermal Wave Laboratory at U.S. Army TACOM, which I think is in Warren, Michigan, back in the 1990s. He also coached, I mean, he's done a lot of interesting things. He coached high school wrestling. Is this what you normally think of when you think of somebody who teaches <laughs> physics and mathematics, teaching wrestling? And he's a professional archer. Um, and uh, a few years ago, maybe with a little arm twisting on my part, Yes. He got dragged into astronomy and hasn't been able to escape its grip since then. So, John, uh, John will be talking to us tonight on modeling the Galilean orbits. Take it away, John. Okay. Uh, share my screen. Can you uh, hear me okay? Yes? Yes. Uh, if I can add one more thing, uh, John and some of his students gave a presentation to this club a few years ago. Do you remember how long ago that was, John? Uh, 2016. Wow, that long ago. Yeah. That was uh, a very early version of the work that he's going to be talking about tonight. He's gone way beyond what they did then. Uh, so I'm anxious to hear what he has. John, you're on. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share with uh, with, with you guys what I've been doing. Uh, and was, I, I especially thank Dale for for getting me involved. And uh, yes, I've been up many, many nights um, doing this work. Um, I have to say that this is the coolest thing that I've done with my students and for, for myself. And uh, uh, the, the, the image you see here is was made in 2016. Um, 
the uh, black dot at the top of the uh, the top of Jupiter there is is Callisto is in in transit. It's not a it's not an eclipse. It's not the shadow, but it's it's actually uh, uh, Callisto in transit. Um, from left to right, uh, the other two white dots are Europa and Io from left to right. So what I want to do here is share with this group what I've been doing for the last five five years in modeling the orbits of the Galilean moons in order to get a more accurate re results, more accurate periods and radii to um, to get uh, the mass of Jupiter and uh, and if, and I get some other other things in the data. Uh, let's see. So moving ahead. Oh, here we go. So it started as an AP physics project, and uh, Dale uh, introduced us, me, to a telescope. Uh, he donated a telescope to, to our school, and I was uh, wanting to do something uh, for my AP physics class, a, uh, a project, a long-term project. And uh, so I decided to, I thought it'd be a good idea to, why not just take pictures of the Galilean moons and and get data to uh, get Kepler's third law and get the mass of Jupiter. I thought, well, well that should be simple enough. <laughs> uh, without knowing that the uh, that there was simulation software already available, I thought getting real data would be a fun thing to do. And I was very excited about doing this activity. Um, I knew from the, from the very be be beginning that a, a simple sine curve would not be sufficient to model the data accurately due to the motion of the uh, two planets, Earth and Jupiter. Uh, so this has grown into an activity I can use not only to reinforce Kepler's law, but to model data and uh, some error handling in my, in my classroom. Um, and little did I realize I would spend the remaining years of my life with this. Uh, so I, I'm still playing. Uh, to uh, get better data, um, to better model the data, I need better equipment. So I, I bought a... Uh, 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 Nexstar 8 SE telescope, 8 inch focal length, 2032 millimeters. Uh, the next uh, Celestron came out with two two cameras after we started this a 5 megapixel camera and a 10 megapixel camera. What was important is that the uh, pixel size changed drastically, much smaller, and the sensor was a little bit bigger. So I got about 10 micro or 10 arc minutes field of view. Still had to take two pictures to get all the moons if. Callisto and Ganymede were on opposite sides. Uh, but if I wanted the students to do the to do this activity, I had to keep it cheap enough, yet obtain good data. Software would be a big expense. Uh, but uh, the software is actually uh, I saw it went too far. Hang on. A lot of the software was uh, re uh, readily available online, um, cheap, free. Uh, uh, kids already had Microsoft Excel. Uh, and I sent them to the Horizons web interface to generate ephemerides. Uh, I thought that was cool. Uh, so not just getting uh, data from the telescope, but, but get on the internet and, and get data from, from NASA, uh, the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. And then the, the analysis software capstone, we bought that for our, our students. Now, the students don't know what which moons are which. Uh, Shallowsky.com, Jupiter, uh, a website was, was very helpful. They can put it on their telephone and, uh, and get the information off the, um, their screens at the same time. So that was, uh, was kind of nice to have. Uh, the images, uh, 2017 was actually pretty nice for imaging. Uh, early in the experiment, I just got my telescope. It was a little, a little bit breezy at night. And so I was learning how to align the, the optics of my new scope. But by May 1st, the images just start to be, uh, were, were pretty decent. And uh, my backyard is not too bad, not, uh, not too many street lights. Uh, each video uh, clips were about 30 seconds long. You get a lot of frames to stack. And uh, now the moons are already are moving during those 30 seconds. So it was an assumption of mine that Registax would average that during those three, those 30 seconds. So I took half the video and added to the timestamp. I uh, reset the clock each night. Um, 
there's trees to the east of me and a house to the west of me, so the so the Jupiter's pretty high in the sky. Took 152 images, so there's, there's about 100, 100 data points per for each moon. So lots of data, covered about 100 days. Uh, here are some of the images that I took. I thought they turned out very well. Uh, see you off to the side, on, uh, right, you know, right to the edge. I'm just, let's see, I got a, uh, see, if this, see if this works or not. But there's, oh, went too far. Uh, let's see. On a pen. So here's, there's a moon right on the edge there. That would be uh, Europa, and then off to the right side of Jupiter is Io and Ganymede. In the bottom image, Callisto is kind of dim. And uh, it's purposely, I want to see the, the cloud patterns in Jupiter. It turns out to be necessary to, uh, to get distances on, on the image to be able to see the cloud patterns. It makes it nice to, for kids to see transits and eclipses. Uh, so I would have to increase the exposure to brighten the moons, but then you would lose the patterns on, on the planet. So and I kept those, but you, but you can still see the moons, even though it's kind of dim. And that last one, Cliss is on the light uh, far left, and then Io below Europa there, left to right. And this one, there's a, I uh, ca caught the image so that Io would be right along the edge of Jupiter. And then you see the eclipse of Europa there. Ganymede is on the far left. Uh, the next image here, there is a moon down at the bottom. Down here, that's that's Callisto. Uh, nope. And then, uh, you know, my my picture is taking some of the screen away. There we go. Uh, Europa is again right on the edge there, and that's uh, it, uh, it's eclipse. Two hours later. Uh, so, sorry, that's a shadow of Io. Uh, some days. It's not advancing. Uh, and the top image, Ganymede, Europa, Io, Callisto, angle to get all the moons on the image. The previous one. There, uh, that one there, sorry. And uh, so I get uh, Callisto's way in the corner here, way up here. And uh, the la last one, um, I have uh, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and that last one here. And there's, uh, again, an, an eclipse of Europa and I are getting close to transit. Sometimes the... Uh, the night was kind of hazy, but you still get some 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 data. You still get the moons. Um, so even on this one, Callisto is on the far left, Europa and Io, and uh, so increasing exposures can still get an image with good data, but you still need the clouds in order to get the north and south poles to get to get distances. These are the last two images. Uh, See, one was in June, the other was in August. August is the last day I took images. It, I got very uh, a lot of turbulence at night, so I stopped taking images. But it is reddened; it is low in the sky, so it kind of reddens like the moon that's and the sun at night or at uh, the horizon. So those are some of the images that I took. And uh, one here is what it looks like for uh, you can see how far the moons move during the, the night each hour. And uh, they move considerably, and so uh, even in two minutes, they they uh, you can see the change in distance from uh, one image to the next. So left to right, Europa came out of the shadows of of Jupiter, and then uh, on the other side, Io, uh, Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, to, so to, to model the data, there are some things that have to that I had to consider. Um, 
One, the changing distance be between the planets will help in three ways. Uh, the light travel time increases during the investigation, so I had to worry about the time, the uh, time difference. The images change in size as uh, we get further away. So on the image, the Jupiter and the system look smaller. And the Earth-Jupiter distances will be useful in dealing with the change in the elongation angle, which I'll address later. Uh, the orbits appear quite, quite elliptical in, from Earth's point of view in 2017, as the orbits are tilted in our point of view. So, I, so we had to find the horizontal component of the position, and I'll explain what that means. As the Earth moved past Jupiter, the elongation angle changes, and so there's a changing phase shift in the data. I'll, I'll show you what that means. There are four moons that pull on each other, uh, producing the, the Laplace resonance of Io, Europa, and Ganymede. And uh, I didn't think I would see that in the data, but uh, I think I do. Uh, the gravitational tug of war between the moons and Jupiter is responsible for Io being so volcanically active and producing what is believed to be a liquid ocean under Europa's icy surface. So when I started looking for a better model, I never thought that I would see the gravitational effects between the moons. And that, but I did know from the start that I would have to account for the changing elongation angle. So here's what we're, we're looking at. Uh, the moon, the uh, planets are moving. So as we get further away, the distance is going to increase. Uh, so I needed to get the Earth-Jupiter distances, and I got that by generating ephemeride. So I had the students do that. They go to have them go to the Horizons web interface and get these distances, and then we're going to be using those. Model those distances with, with the sine curve. Um, over the three months of the experiment, the sine curve is a fairly good approximation. I know it's not the best model, and as a simple, carved, simple sine curve would not take into account the retrograde motion. But, uh, but this approximation, the approximation is used later when modeling the orbits. Um, so problem one, I had, you know, we had to correct for the time, time of light travel from Jupiter to us. Uh, so using not the rounded off number, but the actual value of the uh, speed of light and getting the distance by generating ephemerides at the Horizons web interface. Uh, the purpose of the, uh, the experiment was not to measure everything, uh, so we, uh, we assumed the Earth-Jupiter distances and the diameter of Jupiter, both of those are assumed. I also assumed that, that the time that light had to travel in the orbits was the same as coming from Jupiter, even though from Callisto as much as plus or minus six seconds. Um, but you take that travel time and subtract it from the timestamp of, of the images, and then I call that I call that Jupiter time. Problem two, the images are getting smaller. It's very common to use Jupiter's diameters as a unit of length. Uh, I use the Earth-Jupiter distances to find scaling ratios. Um, I, I did that because uh, the focuser on my telescope is not the best one. So, and also so for hazy nights, I would have to increase the, uh, the exposure, artificially changing the diameter of Jupiter. So I thought maybe um, using the Earth-Jupiter distances to find scanning ratio. So I chose a well-defined image to use as a reference image. And the ratio of the Earth-Jupiter distances from one image to another would be the same ratio as the image heights. So each image has its own unique scaling. So it made all the, all the um, distances the same from image to image that way. And it's a good time to talk about thin lens optics in class, even though it might be later in the year to show how the, uh, the heights um, are calculated. The third problem, the orbits are not viewed along Jupiter's equatorial plane. So even though, so maybe right about here, call that the uh, equatorial plane. Callisto takes this path in 2017, comes around and comes down here. It, it never makes a transit, so it's highly elliptical. So if I measure the distance from the center, you'll, you'll never read zero because it will be up here. 
So we want to find the horizontal component of the distance and plot those. Um, off to the side, there is a Stellarium image of when uh, at, um, at opposition, uh, where Jupiter is in Earth relative from, from the point of view of the sun. So it's about two degrees high. So about two degrees will give you, uh, we'll put Callisto above, above Jupiter from our, from our point of view. So we need the horizontal components, and I had to fi figure out a simple way to do that for for our for my students uh, without having to print them on paper, which would be a very large paper, very expensive. So I think what what would be a good way to do that on the image itself? So what I did uh, the uh, the poles and the moon form a triangle. And so we need to find the uh, the uh, poles. And I built a little device to do that, a little circle with horizontal lines on it. And so you center Jupiter in the circle and then line up the um, cloud patterns with the horizontal lines. And you can uh, get a pretty good idea where the poles are. But now with that I have a triangle, I can get the height of the triangle, which is parallel to the horizontal components. So now we have position and time data. And that's the data that we're going to uh, model. So we did start. We did start out with a simple sine curve, like uh, like everybody else did. Uh, and in Capstone, the the analysis software, you have to estimate a to get it started, and estimate the uh, angular velocity, uh, and seed those into the uh, software. So you estimate period on the screen by using some corresponding images and then solve for omega and then fit the curve in and then you get the period. Um, A will be the average radius. So here's what the uh, data looked like, graphed. And uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, you, you know, kids would say the fits really nice. And, but if you look really close, the data does deviate from the curve a little bit. It's kind of hidden because there's 9 million seconds there. And um, so some uh, uh, the simulation software is, is good with this. They have a, uh, a simple sine curve and get the data, uh, the radius and period this way. But if you look close at that by, by uh, calculating the residuals, find, finding those deviations, there is there are clear patterns still in the data, and uh, we want to get rid of those patterns. So I'm looking for a model that will now get rid of these these patterns. Okay, so it looks like Callisto has some sine curves in it still, and um, I O I O I, I kind of see something like this in here in the data. So I O has some patterns in it. Uh, you may even see some up and down sine curves in it. So we want to uh, get the data to be randomly distributed about the time axis and get rid of the systematic error. So I'm looking for a better fit. And that was my, that's my goal, to find a um, better fit. And, and looking at the deviations, these residuals turn out to be a, an important thing to do. So problem four, uh, the Earth-Sun-Jupiter angle, the elongation angle. Uh, here's a couple images, May 11th to July 12th. July 12th being after uh, what's called quadrature when the angle is 90 degrees. You see the, uh, the eclipse of Io and the, sh the shadow and Io separation is very different. So if you're looking at July 12th, we're further to the left and the sun is further to our right. So the shadow is much further away from, from Io. So this is the, uh, the problem that I had to first solve, I thought. I thought this was the only one I had to solve. And um, so here's what's going on. Here's a little diagram. So taking that one point, we see for Earth is long here, we see the moon at its furthest extent. And then sometime later, we're over here, and we see the moon at, at its further extent. But at the previous location, it would not be at its furthest extent. So there is a phase shift 
um, a constantly changing phase in the data. And uh, for after a long time of thinking what the model should look like with this changing phase, I thought, why not just let the phase angle change in the equation sinusoidally? And uh, so that's what I did. The cylinder image at the bottom here, this is at quadrature on July 5th. Uh, so I did that. I, I let it change. So the equation now like this, this is the changing phase, uh, the changing angle in the equation. And uh, the uh, angular velocity is from the Earth, Earth-Jupiter distances that you saw earlier. And I fixed that. And um, and then I uh, fitted that, and this is what the uh, the deviations, and they're much closer together now. They're much much smaller. Uh, they're not so far away from the time axis. Europa is kind of neat. Um, you can kind of see it come down like this and come up again. Right here, it's it's like right at quadrature, and. Um, Io is doing the same thing. It's coming up and down like this. Ganymede does this here. And uh, Callisto shows a bunch of little sine curves. Oops. Going up and down. It doesn't work too well. Going up and down like this. You can see the sine curves in here. So it, it told me that there was more going on than just um, the phase change. But here's the uh, the results of the uh, simple sine curve and the changing just changing the phase in the data. And, uh, looking at the table, the published periods are on far right, and the published radiuses are on the far right. And compare that to the the model, a simple sine curve, and just the changing phase angle, and the percent difference wasn't too bad. I mean, for high school, that'd be really good. Right, um, the the periods did not get better from changing the uh, model to having a changing phase, uh, but the radius did get better. But I wasn't too concerned about that. I guess uh, what's really important is that there's a measure called the root mean square error, and it's the standard deviation of those deviations from the model. So I'm looking to reduce the root mean square error. Which is which turns out to be the standard deviation of those of those deviations from the model called the residuals. So I'm looking to get a a, a nice random distribution of those deviations in the data. And what was important is that the root mean square error did drastically go down. It went from 39 pixels for a Callisto down to 11, and that was that was dramatic. Um, mass of Jupiter was pretty good within uh, uh, as much as 0.6 percent difference which is uh, very good uh, anybody would be happy with that in high school I'm sure or even in college uh, the published mass of Jupiter there is at the bottom and the fit is not good enough in my mind so I started to uh, start add start to add um, sign terms to uh, account for those other uh, the, the, uh, the uh, sine curves in the data. Looking at Callisto a little more closely, you can, you can see these sine curves in the data all throughout here, going up and down, okay. still deviating from the model. Now, when I started adding sine curves, um, sine terms to the uh, model, I was very excited to see that the angular velocities of those extra sine curves that I was just putting in because I saw sine curves in the data, the angular velocities were very much related to the angular velocities of the, of the values that get the periods of the moons. Uh, so I thought I, I was on the right track, and I did not expect that, and um, it was... I was dancing in this in my room when I saw that. Um, so I, I added four sine terms to the 
to the model. Now, there are three other moons pulling and tugging on each other so, and sinusoidally, so there's three sine curves for those. There's the long period um, pattern that you saw in Europa. So I added a, sine, a, a sinusoidal term for that. So it makes sense to add these terms. Euro, Io, Europa, Ganymede are in a class residence, 421. Uh, the orbital plane is rotating at the same period as the, um, e, the elongation change. And uh, um, so it makes sense to add these, the, uh, these other terms. When I add terms, um, here's the, uh, what happened to the root mean square error, the deviations in Callisto, the red was the sine curve, the simple sine curve, the yellow dots are the added phase change, and then the blue, the it just collapsed. It was it was um, very exciting to see that collapse like that. Um, looking at all the other ones, uh, you see that they're very uh, very small. Uh, look like they're randomly uh, distributed around the uh, time axis, which is what we want. We want this uh, random error in the data. So here's a, a table of those coefficients. Uh, the top line, the angular velocity for each moon by themselves, I color coded them so that you could see them. And then the angular velocities for the other sine terms. The last one is uh, omega six, that's the uh, long long period that you, we saw in the uh, Europa. Those were kept pretty much constant. I had to let Europa float a little bit to make it minimize. But you can see that uh, in you know, Ganymede in blue, uh, close to the value of, of the actual angular velocity of Ganymede itself. Uh, you see uh, Io's value there in all four. Uh, and it's just from the curve for you that those numbers just pop out at you. Then the root mean square, you see how they collapsed um, from the simple sine curve down to the sine series. Very, very nice. And here's the results of that. Yeah. published period next to the uh, experimental period and the percent difference is really, really close. The published radius and the experimental radius again, very, very close. And uh, it's just very exciting to see kind of uh, re re results like that. Um, the goal is to have an experiment collecting data for law and trying to get really good period and radius data get to um, to uh, get Kepler's law. And uh, this model worked very, very well. Law, once you get the period and the radius, plot them, uh, period squared and the radius cubed. And then the uh, graph on the right would be just a log-log plot. Um, I like the log-log plot. Uh, as you know, may know that John Napier de developed logarithms in sixteen in the early sixteen hundreds, and Kepler published his uh, his third law after their the de development. Uh, the log log plot, of course, gives you the powers directly, and you look at the slope. I don't know if you can see that or not. One point five zero 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 three halves. Very very nice, and uh, so you get a nice. Uh, validation of Kepler's law. Excuse the math here, but here's here's what Kepler wrote in his uh, Harmonies of the Worlds. Uh, the periods were from antiquity and the radii are from Brahe's data and those are published in his, uh, his work. And uh, we see Kepler's law in textbooks like this and the uh, the log log plot just sneak down here. K is the um, ten to the two b, where b is the y intercept of that plot that you saw. Kepler finds the law. Newton explains it. So the mass of the orbiting the orbited planet, uh, the orbited body, uses that value k. And uh, so now we get the mass of Jupiter. And here are the, uh, the uh, masses of Jupiter that I got. And uh, I put them side to side with the, um, 
the mass of Jupiter calculated from the published orbital data that you saw on the other table. And the middle column is from my data and the percent difference. And I thought it was very interesting that that the um, the first the first four are just calculated uh, ma the uh, mass calculated from the moon data themselves, so calculate the mass four different times, then average them, and then the t square versus r cubed is from the plot that you saw the t square and r cubed, and then get the mass that way. The slope of the line is the k, and then the log log plot using. Uh, K equals two or uh, ten to the two B to get the mass that way. So it's three different ways to get the mass. Calculate the mass six times, and uh, I thought it was very interesting that even the using the orbital data that's published, you don't get you don't get this number, and that that surprised me a little bit. I thought it'd be much closer than that. I was trying to figure out why that would be that way, and uh, seems to me that that Earth is used to get the mass of the Sun in Kepler's law. And then using the period and radius of Jupiter's orbit, we get the mass of Jupiter plus the sun. That M is then in that equation is both bodies. So you subtract the sun's mass and then you get Jupiter's mass, which includes all the moons. And if you subtract all the moons, you get this number that's on that screen there. Um, but you don't get it from uh, the data from the, the orbital period, uh, periods and radii from the moons. Uh, and it's always a little bit higher. I thought that was very interesting. Um, in 2015, you had resolution to fix, uh, set to an exact value, the nominal Jovian mass. Uh, you see that there. And then using the current value of G, uh, you calculate the mass. So the, here's our, this is our, accepted mass of Jupiter, nominal Jovian mass parameter. And uh, this number changes, the value G changes every four years. Uh, so I've been including the change as I've been uh, doing the experiment. So I thought it turned out really well. Um, I had another set of, it was in 2016. Uh, using the uh, next image five camera and using the same telescope with a reducer, the sensor is a little smaller, so I had to reduce the image, but I still get very good data with the same model, the uh, the sine series model. Time is always really close, I thought, and uh, the radius is pretty good. So after this, I started focusing on IO. And here's the plot of IO's, uh, the model for the IO, da the IO data, or EO. And uh, I want to look at, I want to look at these peaks, the maxima and minima, and just plot those. And when I did that, this is what I saw. Um, on the east side of Jupiter, the west side of Jupiter, whether we be on the right side as, as we look at the images, the east side, there, there's an oscillation in, in the data. And uh, looking at the time between the peaks of this graph, is, it looks like very close to Ganymede's period. Now, I, I, I went to the um, Horizons web interface and got uh, generated the ephemerides for these times. And this is where I got from the ephemerides. And, the concavity looks opposite of what I have here. Uh, maybe I have them backwards, but I don't think so. And the oscillations here are quite large, 1,500 kilometers oscillations, and this is like 30 or 50 kilometers. So it doesn't match that. Um, so I'm, I'm, it might just be an artifact of the model, or who knows. But uh, I, I think it's an artifact of the model. But what was really interesting is the time, the uh, timing. And um, you've seen, uh, most likely you've seen the animation here on the left, but the animation on the right I found by Man Hoi Lee, and it, it shows uh, the Laplace transformation, uh, the, La the Laplace resonance, and uh, it shows that the perijove, uh, Io and Europa meet at perijove when Io is at perijove and Europa is at apijove, and the perijove is drifting. 
Um, I thought that thought that was really cool. And um, so looking a little closer at the Laplace resonance, when I, you take the periods of Ganymede, Europa, and, Euro, and Io, and do the calculations of four of Io, or uh, Ganymede divided by Europa, Ganymede divided by Io, you don't get the four two to one. Um, so to be in a true Laplace resonance, um, the, the mean motion in degrees per day, N, uh, for Io and minus two times that of Europa should be zero. And it's not, you get point about 0.739 and that matches pretty well with, uh, with what was I found in, uh, in the literature by, let's see, um, his name is, I, you know, I don't know how to pronounce it, P-A-I-T-A. -A. He did a um, hundred year study uh, using e e ephemerides and got a range anywhere from 0.7334 to 0.7401. And, uh, so I, I changed all the uh, periods that I got in seconds and changed them to degrees per day. So here are those periods in days, change them to days. And this value here, this is that, um, that the period of the, of the drifting perigels, and right? the uh, 0.739 degrees per day changed into days uh, the period in days. Um, so I converted it back to per to uh, the period instead of the um, mean motion. And this the result here is this. And using the data that I got twice the period of I is that same value. And looking over with Ganymede, so Starting with Europa minus twice of Ganymede, you get the same number, 0.739. And reducing it to this equation here, using Io, four times Io's period, we get the number of days, and then, and then using four times Io's period, we get about the same number. So I want to know if, if that these times are in my data. And uh, so I, I looked at that. And so I... I Looked at every every second peak and every fourth peak uh, on the east and west side. Here is just the east side, and I looked at the difference in time. And this is what I had. Here is the difference in time for every other peak. So every two peaks in the left table here, uh, three hundred five five four five point three seconds, and then divide by the period of I/O one point nine nine eight nine, and then all the way down to the bottom. Here's the average of that, very, very close to exactly two. And then same thing with Ganymedes, uh, four times IO, four, four point, four point zero zero five. Uh, so it looks like the uh, data does in fact have the four two to one resonance. And um, that's what I did, That that's my experiment. And um, do you have any questions? <laughs> any questions? I have a question. Yeah. I think you would, Dale. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get rid of my screen here. Here we go. I mean, I did a super crude version of this experiment. Back when I first joined the Warren Club, I think it was 1997. And I didn't have a camera. I had a eyepiece with an illuminated radical. And I would just eyeball how many divisions on the radical the planet was from each moon and write that down. Um, I didn't know there were these resonances when I started into that. And I saw the ratios were two to one, two to one, that kind of thing. And the ratio of the period of Callisto to that of Ganymede is not two to one. I got that it was about, I mean, I had nowhere near the precision. I mean, that you have, you're a hundred to a thousand times more accurate than me. Probably a hundred times. 
Uh, but I got the ratio of the period of Callisto to that of Ganymede not equal to 2.00, but equal to 2.33. Mm. And I've always wondered whether that simply means they're not, that Callisto is not in resonance, or whether it's a seven thirds resonance. Seven to three, right. So do you think that is an actual resonance? Uh, yeah, when, when, when I read that, it, it, it calls it a resonance. It's just seven to three resonance. It's just not a Laplace resonance. I mean, if you look at um, the asteroid belt, there are gaps in the orbits of the asteroids where there are no asteroids. And those gaps, they're called Kirkwood gaps, are in resonance with Jupiter. And some of those gaps, if you look at the period of asteroids that would be in those gaps compared to the period of Jupiter, you get weird fractional resonances like so many thirds and so forth. Mm. Um, so you're saying it's not a Laplace res resonance, but it is a resonance. Right. Okay. Very interesting. It's, it's not exactly seven to three, it's close to seven to three. It's, it's close to seven to three. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. I, I don't remember the exact ratio, but it's uh, very close to seven to three. I want to add that triple 1027 on the YouTube live chat says great presentation. So I did want to pass it along. I was Any questions? <laughs> It was fun. I, I've taken four sets of data, and I was, I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, another question, are you going to publish this? It is being published, yes. It is being published in the physics teacher. I don't know when it's coming out. Very cool. Yeah. I've, I've given a presentation to a couple of teacher um, uh, conferences and not well attended, so I had a much bigger audience today. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. John, um, I have a very important question. No, I will not be treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, awesome well, response. Well, gosh. Okay. Well, I have a different question then. Um, uh, actually, I was wondering, uh, what is your next project going to be? I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Um, I have to. Uh, they, they always give me a couple ideas. Um, I like. I, I like to look at Europa and Ganymede to see if I can also see the Laplace resonance in those. I haven't done that yet. I like to find out why I'm getting such a big, um, um, big amplitude in that in that uh, one graph. You, the last graph you saw. Why is 150 100 kilometers? If that's just a model or something else is happening i don't know i mean there's a lot you can do with what i've got already and i really like to try that but i'd like to do something else but i i was going to ask you john what do you want to observe that's not jupiter oh well i was thinking about uh well well one thing i was trying to do is uh if i could get the uh period of the uh star around polaris okay that that's awesome yeah, that's awesome. So, any more questions? Well, if not, I'd yeah. like to thank you very much for joining us at such short notice. Um, I know you were on deck for early next year, but thank you very much for coming to address us tonight. Really, You're welcome. my pleasure. It's uh. We wanted to share for a long time. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So we don't have a Coney Island to eat at. So, ladies and gents, adjourn yourselves, enjoy your snacks, enjoy your drinks, and.
when we next meet, it will be the WA selection time. So in the meantime, don't forget calendar submissions, nominations, and ideas for who deserves distinguished service awards. We'll see you in November. Hey, John, you really need to do this. Do what? <laughs> Become an officer of the meet of the club. Oh, you know, I'm 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 a president of my archery club and the president of the Tri County Archery Club and treasurer wait of the Pro Archery. I don't think so. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. I'm going to tell you something. I'm i I'm doing a gazillion things too. Yeah. So, and I am a, a sports official that has done wrestling. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, I know you're busy, but uh, think about it. Well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night, friends. We'll see you. Good night, everybody. Observe Mars and observe the Orionids and you know what, NASA you know, TV. You know what I need? You know what I need? Does somebody have a list of the membership with telephone numbers that I can do some calling and, and pushing and shoving? I think your comrade on the nominations committee would be able to spot you some info. I, I would like to have that list, and I will get on the phone, I promise, and work on a lot of people. So, All right. I'll in the be meantime, glad to do that. Keep looking up if the sky's ever clear. Mars, Orionids, Osiris Rex live on NASA TV, 6 p.m. next week, Tuesday. Deal to go. Over and out, guys. Bye. Night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. That's a long time. All right, all. I am ending the call officially. See you later. Good luck, Adrian. <laughs>